Hey, I'm Dr. Greg Ellis. I want to talk today about what fuel, carbs or fat, powers muscular contraction. Now, man has been eating largely an agriculture diet for 15,000 years, getting away from the meat and fat that they lived on for 2 million years. Nutritional science is relatively new, beginning in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So we really have been studying man as a carbohydrate eater. So a lot of the studies that we've collected to see what fuel powers muscular contraction have indicated that it's carbohydrates. And up until about 1950, it was believed that carbohydrate provided 100% of the fuel used by muscles to contract. Some glitches started appearing in this in the 1950s and 1960s when they started discovering with new technology and techniques of measurement that fat was actually contributing a reasonable amount of fuel for muscular contraction. So this was upsetting the apple cart. Now, in 1939, a technique was developed called glycogen loading by the Swedish exercise physiologist. And they found, by putting two groups of people on a diet that was high in protein and high in fat for the first three days of the experiment, and then leaving one group on the protein and fat and putting another group loading up on carbohydrates, that when they retested their exercise performance after six, seven days, that the guys who consumed a lot of carbohydrate could perform significantly better, and the performance of the protein and fat group was decreased by about 50%. So this was the beginning stage to suggest that fat was not important as a source of fuel for muscular contraction. Glycogen loading experiments continued on and on and on. They still continue today. They've probably been the source of 5,000 PhD dissertations. People studying this over and over and over. And it's absolutely true. I have no argument with it whatsoever. But it's only true in that it's, the time period is six or seven days. People finally started extending the time that athletes and animals were on the low carbohydrate diet. One of the first reports came out in 1977 by a veterinarian here at the University of Pennsylvania who was studying racing sled dogs and their performance. So he significantly reduced their carbohydrate level and they performed better. And he reduced it yet further down to 15% 15 of total calories they performed yet better. And then he took it out of the diet altogether. No carbohydrate at all. And that was their best performance. So he was the first to suggest, and he allowed this to go on for a while, the first to suggest that there's an adaptation period to this diet, a time adaptation period, where the body's machinery, its enzymatic machinery, reworks itself because there's a different set of enzymes in the body to process carbohydrates than those that burn fat. And each of these can be enhanced by both the diet you consume and time. So what we call the antecedent diet is very important if you're going to look at any kind of dietary experiment. What kind of diet were you on before you made a, a change and studied something in that person? This is what happens a lot of times in the carbohydrate-restricted diets. The person's been eating carbohydrates, and now they begin to manipulate the fat, reduce the carbohydrates, and they don't get the response that they think will occur because it can't, because the enzymes to process the fat aren't in place. This is the, one of the main problems with the Atkins version of the low-carb diet. He immediately puts you on 20 grams of carbohydrate and says, okay, let's start burning fat. Well, you can't do it. So that's the reason that a lot of people quit the Atkins diet, because the first three days, you just feel terrible, because you have no fuel. You remove the carbohydrates that you're used to burning. you got plenty of fat around, but you can't process it. So that's the problem we run into. Now, some other experiments were begun where we looked at uh, longer time periods. In humans, we looked at four weeks on the diet, and they performed just as well as the people on the uh, normal carbohydrate diet. One of the long-term studies that happened was a study out of France using rats, and they put them on 12 weeks of adaptation to a low-carbohydrate diet. After that time, they ran in the treadmill 62% longer than the rats eating a carbohydrate meal. So that was the first indication that performance could be fairly dramatically increased by using fat as a source of fuel. Well, all the glycogen loading studies just continued, and 
they've become the key thing that everybody does, bodybuilders, athletes, uh, bicyclists, rowers, they all, they all believe in glycogen loading. Now your muscles contain about 300 grams of, gl of glycogen, glycogen is nothing more than a glucose molecule strung together, and in your liver you've got about 100 grams of glycogen. So if you had to rely on this, you'd get maybe three days of fuel and then you're out. Now, the glycogen loading studies have continued unabated since that time, and many of our athletes and even today the, the, fitness, the fitness crowd, they all believe that you've got to replenish your glycogen. So after their workouts, and to help, they believe, enhance their performance, they try and replete their glycogen stores by consuming high carbohydrate drinks or bars or meals or whatever in the belief that this is going to increase the concentration of glycogen and thereby help their performance. Well, they would be far better off if they would forget about the glycogen, start eating a carbohydrate restricted diet, and enhance their ability to burn and store fat. Now, fat can be stored in the muscle as something called an intramuscular triglyceride, similar to the glycogen, except it's a, a form of fat. And in, intramuscular glycogen can be enhanced and it can be processed rapidly if you have adapted and you get the necessary enzymes built up in the body over time and your performance will go through the roof and your performance will improve in very intense exercise as well. So this is one of the things exercise scientists have been saying for years that you can't rely on fat in intense exercise but they have no clue that this thing is all dictated by enzymes. And they haven't been studying this topic because ever since fat and cholesterol were implicated in the heart disease issue in the 1950s, we can't study fat because even if it helps us improve our performance, it's the, the implications for cardiovascular health are such that it just won't work. So it turns out that, of course, fat and cholesterol really never were involved in the heart disease thing, but we don't know that yet as a society and as a culture and within our medical establishment, although it's, the story is well established. So we still stay away from the consumption of fat for those reasons, and your performance will go down, and your weight will go up, and your body fat will go up if you continue to consume a high carbohydrate diet. So that's the story on carbohydrate loading, and you really should get away from it particularly if you're interested in performance, you're going to become fat adapted. This takes many, many weeks and your performance will be absolutely stunning. I'm Dr. Greg Ellis.